Welcome to the Luke Messias Show. Today, we are in studio with Representative Tom Oliverson, who chairs the Insurance Committee, one of the more powerful committees, more influential committees regarding policy in the Texas House. But more importantly, Representative Oliverson has recently decided to run for Speaker of the Texas House. So today, we're going to talk about not only what brought him to the legislature, but some of the vision that he has for where the Texas House could head. We are at a point in time in Texas history that we talk about pretty regularly, but uh, our level of friction in Texas politics within various factions of the Republican Party has been at an all-time high, but I think there is a path to many of those conflicts being reduced and Texans being better served as a result, and we're going to break some of that down with Representative Oliverson today. Let's get to the show. Tom, thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to start by just everybody, because I think there are quite a few people in Texas who in the last couple of weeks have asked themselves, who's Tom Oliverson, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And so for those of us in Texas politics, we know you a lot better. Um, But I do want to just start off with you kind of telling everyone why you decided to run for the legislature. You've been there for four sessions. This will be your fifth session you're going mm-hmm. into. So what made you decide to run for the legislature? What were some of the things when you decided to run that you were most motivated to try to address? Yeah, that's a great question. So I um, I never really wanted to be in politics. I never really saw that as something to aspire to. Um, I think as a, as a lifelong Christian and a conservative, I didn't like a lot of what I saw in Austin and Washington. I didn't like the stories. But I kept having people tell me, you know, you should think about running for office. You're, you know, you make good decisions. You're, you know, you have the right moral character. Um, you seem like you know a lot of stuff. I, I remember there was a there was a couple that was very influential um, in my thought process. Um, Bob and Liz McEwen. Bob is the the uh, um, CEO of the Center for National Policy. And we got to know them through some very just sort of random circumstances. Uh, my wife uh, was in a program called MOPS, Mothers of Preschoolers, with one of their daughters. Mm. And uh, so we got to know them. And I remember having this conversation, could not be more sort of idyllic, right? I'm sitting on my back porch with Liz McEwen, watching her grandkids play with my kids in the pool on the 4th of July. And this was back in like 2012. Yep. And she turns to me and she says, you need to run for office because you know, I've gotten to know you, this country needs people like you. And I said, why? And she said, because you have the right moral character, you will have good judgment, you will make good decisions and you won't get corrupted. And I said, you know, I hear that all the time, but the problem is when I look at Austin, when I look at Washington, I don't always see that. In fact, I sometimes see the opposite. And her response to me was, if you don't like what you see right now, you need to understand that it's because people like you who could stand up and do this for the right reason, won't stand up and sacrifice and take time out of their life to serve. That's why we have the problems we have, because if you won't do it, others will, but they don't share your values. And that was very sort of, I guess, uh, pivotal for me in terms of my thought process. So a little time after that, my wife came to me and she'd been praying about this, um, just completely separate train of thought. And just said, look, I, I just think all of these things are happening in our life. And I just really feel like God's calling you to public service. And I said, you know, that's really interesting because I've been thinking the same thing. And I told her about that conversation. We prayed about it. Um, I prayed a couple more times. I think the thing that really made the difference is one day I was coming back uh, from a trip and I was on an airplane and I just got before, before God there and I prayed and I just said, God, if this is your will for me, I'll do it but send me a sign so that I know it's your will and not my will. And it was shortly thereafter that my state representative, Alan Fletcher, announced he would be running for sheriff. And so I called my wife and I said, I guess guess we're gonna do this. And she's like, yes, we are. So that's how I started. Um, And so I've always looked at it as a mission field Mm -hmm. for me. This isn't something I look at as a career. I know some of my colleagues, and I know you know people too, that kind of look at this as like, this is what I wanna do for my life, right? I have a good job, but I'm doing this because I want to serve people and I want to serve God by serving others. A little uh, unknown bit of Texas political uh, factoid that I think is funny is that you replaced Alan Fletcher mm-hmm. and he, I need to go back and look at the results, but I believe he was either just elected or he's in a runoff for 
Justice of the Peace. He was, yes. In Lano. Do you know what the results were of that election? I, I don't think he prevailed, Okay, unfortunately. He's a good man. But I don't well, I ended up there several times. I moderated a couple forums there. And so he was there and did a great job presenting his ideas and all of that. So that is, a, it's a small world. So he it then is. moved to the Hill Country and then just read for Justice of the Peace, the gentleman who you um, replaced. So in the legislature, you came in, and I would say over the last four sessions, um, people have largely seen you vote conservative. Mm -hmm. um, you also were somebody who was in leadership. I, I think that's probably safe to describe mm -hmm. you as somebody, you know, if you're chairing a more powerful committee in the legislature, you're somebody aligned with leadership, both under the Bonin uh, leadership team and then the Dade Phelan leadership team. When you announced you had a bunch of stuff to say, and we're going to cover a little bit of that mm -hmm. today, what leads you to the point of because the way I explain to people is different people kind of play different roles in the political system. Right. So some people will get in and say, I think I'm going to uh, maybe abide by the structure that is set a little bit more here. And then some people go, I don't like the way the structure is set, so I'm going to try to change the structure. And then there's this pool in different factions, even people who maybe want some of the same policy goals. Your announcement puts you in a place where you're talking about changing a structure, a structure that you've been in for the last several sessions. Walk me through kind of the process from going from kind of being within that structure to saying the structure needs to change. Yeah, what so, gets you there? So I think, you know, to, to start with, I would just say that I've always been somebody who cares more about policy and value than I care about labels or, you know, what, what we said to each other yesterday or stuff like that. I, I really, and I think my colleagues on both sides of the aisle would back up that I really do have pretty thick skin and I don't keep a record of wrongs. Mm -hmm. And so if you were with me, uh, if you were not with me yesterday, but there's a bill we can work on today, it doesn't matter if you're the most progressive Democrat, the most conservative Republican, I want to work with you as long as it's good policy. Mm -hmm. And some of my best policies actually don't have my name on them, even though I wrote the bill. Mm -hmm. And I'm cool with that. I've mm -hmm. always been fine. Just give me the policy and I, that's what I really want. So I, I was sort of brought into this leadership circle, I think pretty early as someone who gets along with everyone, who works hard, um, who really isn't seen as somebody who, you know, essentially wants to throw bombs or somebody who just kind of wants to sit back and maybe just kind of enjoy the life, but not really do anything. I mean, I, I roll up my sleeves. I'm hardworking. When the work is done, I go home. You know, I'm not, I'm not one of those that's out till two in the morning socializing. Yeah. Um, but I started to see a pattern of behavior that I just really didn't like. And it kind of goes back to, a lot of the conversations that conservatives were having when in the summer after Joe Strauss announced he wasn't going to run for re-election. And if you remember that, there was sort of a blow up during the special session when the conservatives, which were in the majority of the caucus, essentially revolted and voted to overrule the chair. Yes. He didn't lose that vote because the Democrats backed him up, yep. but he lost the majority of his own caucus. Yes. And that was sort of the end for him, right? Mm -hmm. That group came together and said, you know, there's a lot of things that we want to do differently. Um, you know, we we don't like this whole business of lording our power over members and sort of pushing them around and telling them how they have to vote and, you know, this and that and the other thing. Um, and it was, it was great for a while. Um, and then I just started to see a lot of some of these same behaviors, you know, mm -hmm. um, cropping up where, you know, bombs would get dropped on us. We'd be sitting on the floor and it'd be like, we're working on a bill and it's a contentious bill and nobody knows what we're supposed to be doing here. That there's poor communication and things are just kind of getting dropped. And, um, you know, we were, we were, obviously there were deals that were being made. I wasn't a part of those deals, but there were clearly sacrifices that were being offered in order to quote, keep the peace. And it wasn't working. Right, mm -hmm. the Democrats ran away last summer, mm -hmm. despite the fact that there were things that we decided not to do that we could have done. Right, yeah. um, the Paxton thing was kind of a big deal to me. Uh, now, as, as has been reported, I wasn't there. Yeah. My son graduated from high school that weekend. That was well known, um, but it was it was I really wanna, hard for you, me to accept. You bring that, that up. I want to ask you one one quick question, and I think because I think. Uh, 
you did talk about that on the Mark Davis interview, and I think mm-hmm. this actually is helpful for people to understand. You're the chairman of insurance. You're somebody who would be considered, let's just say, in the top 20 of leadership. You know, you're, mm-hmm. you're kind of top chairman, and then you have your really top chairman, and then you have your speaker and the people he can listen to the most. But at the point in time that you're making these plans, no one expected an impeachment Mm-mm. discussion or vote to happen in that those last couple of days of session. It was so secretive, Luke, that I still to this day, and maybe I'm just that far out of the circle, I probably am, um, nobody actually will tell me or, or have I not been able to figure out whose idea was that anyway. Mm-hmm. It just, it hit us all out of the blue. It yeah. was so cloak and dagger. And um, I just didn't feel good about it. Yeah. You know, I, I remember thinking to myself, it's good that I'm not here today because there's going to be pressure that you know, you're supposed to do what the team wants you to do, but I just don't think this is right. I don't think this has been deliberative. Mm-hmm. I don't think this is a good process. Yeah. Um, so that, that was a big deal for me. Uh, I think the thing that really sort of just broke the dam loose for me, uh, and again, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that this wasn't something where I just sort of got hit in the head with a coconut and decided to run for speaker. Yep. yep. Uh, it was a lot of little things added together over time that I just— would get under my skin and I'd be sitting there quietly at my desk trying to be, just do my work. And it just kept building and building. But when I woke up the day after a primary and I mm-hmm. saw how many Republicans, incumbents had lost, I realized it was it was abundantly clear to me that the people of Texas were calling for change. Yeah. And I had really two choices at that point. I could just keep doing what I had been doing and sit there quietly and bite my tongue, which I didn't think I could do any longer. I just... I just had had enough. Or I could stand up. Maybe the timing wasn't the best. I could just stand up and just say, look, this is not working any longer. Maybe it was at one point, but this is not the direction the voters want us to go. I am tired of coming home and having to explain to my constituents uh, things that they know aren't true because that's what we're you know, supposed to come home and say, oh, well, you know, you don't really understand how the House works and the Democrat chairs are really helpful and it keeps the temperature down and, you know, blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. They're saying to us, no Democrat chairs. That's three words. The simplest explanation takes a minimum of 10 minutes and it really doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it. Yeah. I was like, it's time for somebody to stand up and just give the voters what they voted for, Mm -hmm. which is actual representation. During your announcement, um, a member of the media pushed you on the Democrat chair position and they used um, kind of the devil's advocate position, which is, well, can you name a Republican priority that died in a Democrat committee? Um, Now, this happened under Bonin when he put Sinfronia Thompson as chair of public health. Mm -hmm. So she had like the heartbeat bill Mm -hmm. and a Democrat in charge of constitutional carry. That changed, but you shared a story during that announcement that I don't know everyone has heard um, and there might be other stories you have that revealed additional problems that exist with Democrat chairs, even if you do keep them out of the top committees, quote unquote, that see the big Republican policies. So can you both share that story and then just talk to us about the kind of culture that's created when you give Democrats the type of leverage they have with the chair? Yeah, absolutely. I, so I, the last two sessions, I've been a chairman. In the last two sessions, I've had a Democrat chairman, essentially on the same level, right? Equal footing, Mm -hmm. chairman to chairman. Can I get a hearing on my bill, please? Oh yeah, sure, no problem. This was in 2021. The reason that the National Motto Act passed as a Senate bill is because the Democrat chair of public education killed my House bill. That was the original bill. I was just smart enough to go to Senator Hughes and say, would you please file a companion to my bill just in case I need it. Yep. And lo and behold, I needed it because I kept asking, I kept asking, yeah, 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 no problem. We'll get you a hearing. Never got one. This last session, because I carried a bill, which i real I'm, quick, just tell everyone what that bill did. So that bill ba- is the bill that basically said that if a, um, if a school district is presented with a framed copy of the national motto, yep. that they have to put it up in the school. Yeah. As long as it doesn't cost anything, as long as it's framed, as long as it meets certain requirements, 
it was really not a terribly controversial bill. When yeah. we got it to the floor, yes, there was a handful of Democrats that asked me questions about whether I was a Christian nationalist and stuff like that. And uh, I was kind of like, um, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. What is, you know, this is a very simple, straightforward bill. We worked through that. We got the bill passed and as how a many, Senate bill. Do you remember what it passed with vote-wise? I think it was actually bipartisan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it it was uh, certainly the Republicans all voted yes. for it, but I think it was bipartisan. Yes. And uh, I don't remember the exact vote count, but like I said, it wasn't terribly controversial, yes. but it almost didn't happen because yes. a Democrat chair didn't want to have a hearing on it. Yeah. And look, I mean, honestly, he's a a Democrat in, uh, in an urban area and, you know, the teachers union was already mm -hmm. after him because mm -hmm. he's pro-school choice and some yeah. other things. And so- does he need a bill like that to pass out of his committee or is that going to cause trouble for yeah. him? I mean, I think if I was in his shoes, I would probably make the same call. So my point is, why put him in that position mm -hmm. by giving him a, a leadership position where he's going to basically kill these bills? Yes. Fast forward to this session, yeah. very different story. Myself and other conservatives too uh, had bills that were very important bills. My important bill this session, I think a lot of your listeners like it, uh, ended the practice of mutilating children's genitals in Texas mm -hmm. as part of this transgender movement. Mm -hmm. And that was bill was SB 14. Yes. There was a Democrat chair who basically killed two of my bills, non-controversial bills. One of them had to do with paramedics providing mm -hmm. healthcare in medically underserved areas. She was angry that I had carried SB 14 and actually went as far as when my stakeholders, my paramedics went to ask why their bill wasn't getting a hearing, actually went as far as to tell them that they didn't have a subject matter problem. They had an author problem. Mm -hmm. And she was mad at me because of this other bill I was carrying. This is the same chair who referred to the speaker and the leadership team throughout the session as a bunch of quote Nazis mm -hmm. because of SB 4 and, yeah. and other bills that on border security. So. And then I'm not the only person that she killed yeah. bills for. Yeah. I think there were other conservatives that lost bills in her committee as well. Well, you give them power and then you're surprised they use it. You hear this on the floor quite often from members when they'll talk about, you know, some bill that a county commissioner gave them to do. It's not a headline grabbing bill, but it's a real piece of policy that if it gets to the floor, will probably get over a hundred votes, maybe 150. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, these are not controversial issues. And they have a real family or a real elected official or a paramedic in their district who says, this is an important thing for me. Mm -hmm. And they're late in the session and they're put in these situations where Democrats can come to them and say, that bill that would fly through the legislature might not ever see the light of day. I might not ever bring it up for a vote if you vote on this amendment, pass this bill, mm -hmm. bring this up. This and this, you're not the only one this happens to. For sure. So um, you've talked about Democrat chairs. You the the uh gender mod bill, SB 14. I wanna we'll come back to the speaker race in just a second, but I, I actually think that that is one example. There's there's people in the building that have a very hard time working with everybody, if that makes sense. And right. one of the things I think that benefits uh, and I'm just going to say this as a, as a compliment to you, is that in that situation, you were put in a place where you could have either worked with everybody who had interest in this policy and a desire to see it passed, or just a couple people. And I do think that there are a lot of conservative organizations and people that mm -hmm. find in the Senate maybe an environment where everyone gets brought in and we try to find something that works. And when you were put in charge of that policy, essentially— uh, I thought you did a great job bringing everybody in and saying, we're going to figure out how much we can get out of this policy, what we can get through the process. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that every state representative I talked to who worked with you on that, every organization all said, Tom's being honest. He's shooting us straight. We know where we're at. And we're trying, because there were a lot of people that wanted a lot out of that piece of policy. Um, when we Look back, I, I, I wanted to get your insight into this because I think very few lawmakers understand the transgendering of children that's happening as well because they haven't lived it, they haven't gone through right. it. Looking ahead at next session, we have the issue of detransitioners. Yes. We have the issue of social transitioning of all these children. These are things that weren't addressed last session, but will be policy discussions. Can you 
just share with people your perspective on the detransition issue, on the social transitioning issue, irregardless of, or, you know, people say irregardless is not a word. So regardless of whether you're a speaker is, you know, talk about those policy issues as we sure. go to the next session, if you don't mind. Sure. So I think on the, let me do the detransition issue first, because yes. I think that's a little, that's a little more straightforward. Yeah. The reality is, is that uh, because of pressure from the left, insurance companies will pay to transition you to the opposite gender, which medical studies on all sides of the aisle, you know, whatever your bent is, will acknowledge leads to lifelong medical dependency in one mm -hmm. form or another. You're either dependent on drugs mm -hmm. or you have complications from surgery that lead to, you know, treatments and things like that. Your, your normal biology is forever altered and mm -hmm. you will always be dependent on the healthcare system in some form or fashion for your, for what you need. If you want to go back the other direction and restore some of what you lost, interestingly enough, insurance companies by and large won't cover that. Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting that they'll pay to get you to the other side, but if you're looking for a return ticket, there aren't any. Yeah. They'll uh, pay for the so, destruction, but they won't pay for the restoration. And so we had a bill this session that would have fixed that, and it didn't make it across the goal line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things don't, right? And uh, that is something that has to be done. That actually came through my committee, mm -hmm. that particular bill. Um, they actually, there is sort of a national movement on that right now. They call it the trans, uh, D-Trans Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. I think you, you may be familiar uh, with Chloe Cole as a, yes. has been quite a, a yes. spokesperson for this, yes. but there are, there are other great friends that I've met who are detransitioners who are, you know, are struggling with this, mm -hmm. right? And so they need healthcare. Mm -hmm. Medical science has put them in a position where they're now dependent on a system that got them to the other side and yep. maybe halfway back or wherever they are. But the reality is, is that now they have healthcare needs that they would not have had yes. had we not damaged their biology mm -hmm. permanently. Uh, and they need they need to be taken care of. They need that care. So that's that has to be taken care yes. of. That needs to be addressed. The psychology piece is very difficult and very yep. complicated um, because there's a very, very good psychologist out there uh, and I remember him telling me as we were preparing for this hearing, he said, look, what a lot of my colleagues that are sort of pro-transition don't understand is that as a psychologist, it's not my job to affirm their identity. Yep. It's also not my job to reject their identity. It's my job to have a conversation with them while we explore these things and help them figure out who they really are, right? So he's taking this position of, as a therapist, you should never be pushing your client in one direction. You should be providing support and counseling and sort of going through a process where they're trying to work this stuff out. The psychology of gender dysphoria is that a large percentage of adolescents affected with gender dysphoria, by the time they hit their 20s, it resolves. Mm -hmm. So forcing them down a pathway of medicalization is actually counterproductive. Yep. So on top of that, we also have a system where social transitioning often happens in a school system. Mm -hmm. uh, and that adds a whole other level of mm -hmm. complexity. There was another bill that didn't make it across the finish line this session um, that I hope makes it next session that would prohibit a school district from engaging in any type of psychological or um, you know counseling, those kind of treatments yes. without written parental consent. Yeah. Because what I found in my work on the on the gender modification bill is that a lot of times parents are totally ambushed by a psychologist and a school counselor who pull them in and say, hey, your kid's been socially transitioning at our school for the last six months. And now you have two choices. You can either have a live daughter or a dead son. Mm -hmm. And they feel totally ambushed by this. I heard this story over and over and over again. And granted, there's probably some where that's not what happens, right? But it's happening enough yep. that I think we do need to look at what I refer to as the school to clinic pipeline mm -hmm. and shut that down. Yep. Yeah. Where, I mean, the, you're getting into the waters of the fact that we have taxpayer funded institutions that are transing kids. Mm -hmm. Just to simplify it down to one sentence, right? Like, I think everybody would agree that not a penny of taxpayer money in Texas should be spent transing a child. In any, that, that is, that is, 
the indoctrination pipeline. And I, I call it a pipeline too, because you have a three-year-old kid that either gets stuck in a psychologist's office, stuck in a school counselor, and all of a sudden yeah. they don't realize they get stuck on the very beginning of a pipeline that for some people is a decade, two decade long journey that can ruin and destroy their lives, right? And, Based and the, on a lie that they weren't created by a creator with a particular purpose. Exactly. And in and, and all of that, in my opinion, stems from a worldview in public education. I think it was, it was put eloquently by a teacher uh, who was angry when KDISD passed their parents' Bill of Rights thing. You may recall that. That was very close to home to me where the okay. KDISD basically had this policy where they're like, look, we're not we're not going to engage in any of this kind of stuff anymore without parents being involved, right? Mm -hmm. no, novel concept, involve parents. Yep. Her response was essentially to say, well, you know, a lot of times the teacher is actually a better role model for these kids than the parents. And the teacher yep. may be the only person that the kid trusts. So, you know, sort of this marginalizing parents that a lot of times we see in the educrat world yep. where they, they, you know, they want to supplant the role that parents play in a child's life. I actually think quite frankly, that this is a large part of the reason why the school choice conversation chorus gets louder and louder and louder is because all of these social issues that are going on in school are really unnerving parents yep. that they feel like their children are being taken away from them. Yep. It's not reading, writing, and arithmetic anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of other stuff. You're, you've mentioned a couple of bills that didn't make it across the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a really good segue into another part of your announcement, which talked about speeding up the process. Right. Um, and this is something that a lot of people get frustrated about because the legislature comes in, y'all only meet for five months every two years, but sometimes you're really not meeting for like more than three months every two years. And so explain... Uh, first, I want you to talk about just kind of some of the things you said in that announcement about speeding up the process, mm -hmm. about creating a structure that will dictate maybe better results, that will, will create an environment where more of these, there will be less statements made by Republicans that say, we were, and that didn't get across the finish line. We ran out of time. How do, how, do we, how do we reduce that? And you have kind of laid out some ideas. So I want you That's to talk right. about those. No, I appreciate that. I think every every person listening who's who's out there in the in grassroots world is tired of hearing the excuse of we ran out of time. Yes, right? yes. And that's sort of what we're talking yes. about here. So look, I think um, what I said was that we need to get started sooner. And yes, there are certain limitations on what the House can and can't do in the first couple of months of session. Um, but when the governor declares an emergency action item, which he always does, mm -hmm. these are policies that we can get to work on immediately. Yep. Just like we would in a special session, we can move very rapidly on those. And so we should. But I will tell you that the reason that this happens, quite frankly, is that as long as I've been in the House, no matter who the speaker is, and I've been through three, there is this philosophy that somehow clock management and slowing things down at the beginning of this session is the most positive thing we can do for building relationships in the house. Uh, we almost never, in fact, to my knowledge, have never taken up a controversial issue or a platform priority type bill before the budget gets passed, which yeah. as you know, doesn't get passed until, until later the, in this session. The end, yeah. And that is, and so the, the calendars that we start with are oftentimes sort of this team building exercise, you know, where we're, we're passing, we're passing a lot of Democrat bills, to be mm -hmm. honest. We're yeah. passing a lot of bills that people back home don't really care about. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, that's great. I'm glad people are getting their bills done, but yep. there are all of these things that need to get done and we'll get around to doing that sometime late April, early May. That type of clock management lends itself to what my Democrat colleagues engage in in one of their favorite pastimes, which is the the chubbing thing, mm -hmm. where we intentionally, you know, when when you see that the end is near, it's like when you're a football team and you're up by two scores and there's four minutes left on the clock, you just run the ball. Yep. Right. And you you take as long as you can to get the next play off because yep. you're you're trying to chew up the clock, and so. I think that one of the things that we've done wrong historically is that we don't get some or all of these priorities done early enough mm -hmm. that they're not within striking distance of the clock running out by the time we get to them. Some of the delay, if, if committees started earlier, it still 
doesn't mean that some of the bills they're working on early aren't the non-controversial bills. That's right. To your point, like meaning if if a committee gets started early, it could still hear all these non-controversial bills and move them out earlier. But then what happens is that delay means that there's hearings going on in late March when this committee might have seven or eight conservative policies that have all been referred to the committee, but it also has mm -hmm. 60 other bills. So uh, I think that's an interesting point that you make, which is is that the delay, once it starts, it's it it, it just kind of compounds on itself. It what does. happens, because you're a chairman and you know other chairmen, what happens when chairman... Do you ever see situations where people start organizing earlier? What what's kind of the pushback that happens? Yeah, I mean that's happened to me. So I mean, you you mentioned non-controversial. I mean, I would tell you that with the exception of the detransitioner bill of rights bill yep. and the ESG bill, which we did fortunately pass, <laughs> yes, was the last bill that passed of this session. Yep. Um, we don't hear controversial bills really in insurance, uh, and so. I remember one session, I, and for the life of me, I, I've thought about this, but I can't remember if it was this session or last session. We got organized, and man, I was ready to start hearing bills literally the first week. I wanted to get going, because the, the bottom line is they're they're not controversial. Mm -hmm. Let's get to work. And I was advised, um, you know, sort of through the grapevine by the back office, like, eh, you know, let's slow it down a little bit there. You know, hold your horses. You know, we don't want to get off to too fast of a start. Yeah. Um, it's again, it's this philosophical difference that that I personally have that if I was leading the house, I would have a different vision. The current vision is one of delay is good for morale. Mm -hmm. um, it keeps everybody on the opposite side of the aisle happy. Uh, and so we're going to do that. And I really think, you know, again, and I've said this before, one of my least favorite games to play, but it's literally the game we play every session is good Senate, bad house. Yep. And I think that the reason why a lot of times it's bad house is because we get off to a slow store start. We don't take up the things that matter to the people that elect us back home at the same time the Senate does. They're working late nights in February we're going out to dinner because we finished our business and we're off the floor before noon. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that that creates a perception amongst the, the electorate back home yeah. that is impossible to overcome. I want to get to, uh, let, let's wrap up the, the speed deal. I want to get specifics from you because you laid out a couple of specifics mm -hmm. on the type of things that you think could structurally change in the House to speed up the process. One of them you already mentioned is once the governor says something's an emergency item, that thing can literally have can fly. all of the same thing. You can have a hearing, you can vote it out, you can put it on calendars, you can put it on the calendar. Before, literally before you're allowed to do that with other bills, which means that if there could be debates of days early in the session where that's the only thing being debated because none of the other bills could even be that's heard. Right. And some of the governor's priority bills like that won't get heard until May. So that's one you've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. What are other things specifically that you think the speaker has the power to do that would speed things up? So again, I think it, I think it, as, as we alluded to, I think part of that is getting your committees up and running quickly, yep. right? Yep. And so I think that really is sort of one of those um, big tasks. Yes. And, and look, it's not just a task in the House. The Senate has to go through it mm -hmm. too. The numbers are obviously smaller, but there's a yep. lot of factors that have to yep. be considered. You know, you need yep. balance in your committees. You need different parts of the state represented, rural, urban. You're looking for subject matter experts on some of these yep. technical committees. And, and you want people that are, you know, going to be able to digest some of this stuff and move good policy. So you got to get that up yes. and running quickly. Yep. I really think that um, the other thing is, let's not underestimate the importance of resetting the relationship between the governor the governor's office, the lieutenant governor, the Senate, and the House yep. to work collaboratively and prioritize how things are going to go and mm -hmm. who's going to do what and how quickly can we move on this and stuff like that. To my knowledge, there's not only a lot of conversations that were happening towards the end of mm -hmm. session that weren't heated and mm -hmm. angry and confrontational yep. and unfriendly. Um, that just really doesn't make for a productive session. So I think that just slows stuff down. Uh Right now, the Texas House is seen as a whole, and this is not an indictment on every single member, but this is just the institution as a whole, is seen as an institution that is at war with the Attorney General, mm -hmm. at war with 
the agriculture commissioner of the state of Texas, at war with the lieutenant governor and the Senate, kind of good Senate, bad House, Senate versus House, and not on board with the governor in a friendly working way, um, at war with the Republican Party of Texas, the state Republican executive committee. So the average voter, if they meet their depart- agriculture commissioner, they meet their attorney general, they meet their leader in the Republican Party, they say, well, the Texas House is at war with us. Mm-hmm. What do you see from your vantage point as the path to reducing those conflicts and getting the House? Because I think there are members of the House who are at war quote unquote, with these people and never, never sign the declaration themselves. Does that make sense? I mean, they're no, sitting totally. there going, I see that. I didn't, I did I just got elected. I ran somebody on my back porch said to run for the office. I got here and all of a sudden I'm at war with these institutes. I don't know why the agriculture commissioner doesn't like us. I didn't even know we have basically tried to screw his agency eight different ways. I'm just here. So what, where do you see the path being for this institution kind of getting to a place where the conflicts are less. Well, first of all, I think we have to be willing to meet people halfway and just sort of bury the hatchet, right? Um, And I think if there was a super compelling, overarching reason why I think a lot of people realize that we're going to need to have a leadership change, regardless of who it is. I think it should be me, but obviously others may, or maybe somebody else, but whoever it is, we can't maintain the status quo as dysfunctional as all of these relationships currently are. Mm -hmm. We have to reset the scoreboard to zero, zero. If it were me, I would reset the scoreboard and then I would chuck it out the window Mm -hmm. because my philosophy as a lawmaker has always been, I don't, I don't keep a record of wrongs, Mm -hmm. right? But I do think that people have egos and I do think what happens over time is people remember that somebody said something ugly about them on social media Mm -hmm. and they want to hit back. Mm -hmm. They want to poke them in the eye. Here's my chance, right? Um, I just think that's all very juvenile. And I don't think that actually helps us get the work done Mm -hmm. that the people of Texas want us to do. Again, remember, I'm not the guy who stays out late carousing with people and having a good time Mm -hmm. and slapping backs and all that kind of stuff. I'm the guy that shows up early, does the work and goes home. Yep. And that's what I care about. I care about the policy. And I don't care about all these, you know, well, so-and-so did this to me in the past. Mm-hmm. I, I almost feel like, in some respects, there's a little bit of a Stockholm syndrome going on in the mm-hmm. House where we sort of feel like, as House members, that everyone else in Texas is against us. And so we constantly have to fight everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just don't see that. Number one, I don't think that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, and number two, I don't think that's very productive. Yeah. You know, Again, what would be the harm in having a House that worked hand in hand with the Senate to get the things done that the people actually want us to get done. Why does it always have to be a competition? Yeah. Why does it always degenerate into a fight? I just think that's not productive. And that's not why we're here. We're not here to fight. We're here to get stuff done and go home. There can often, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about, I think there might also be a perception between a lot of Republicans in the House that everyone who has been critical of the House just wants to be critical of the house Mm -hmm. for the next 10 years. And I keep telling everybody like, no, that, that there's a path to that not happening. There's not a goal. I don't think that the Lieutenant governor, the attorney general, our agriculture commissioner, the chairman of the Republican party of Texas, even the individuals that I'm very familiar with and work very closely with who have been very critical of the house for a long time. uh, I believe that the goal is for us to get to a place where there's collaboration and cooperation yeah. happening to advance conservative public policy for the state of Texas. The state of Texas has actually been getting more red over the last couple of years. For sure. And this gives us a window of opportunity to pass policy that, you know, has really been left. And I'm glad you said that because I think, you know, I hope that uh, as I talk to my colleagues, I think some of them see this and some of them don't. Yeah. I hope that they recognize that one of the messages that we received, at least I received loud and clear from the voters on primary day, is that Texas has become more red. Mm -hmm. And that some of these issues that maybe weren't issues when Tom Craddock was speaker, Mm -hmm. um, they're issues now. They're legitimate issues. People want to see a majority Mm -hmm. party that they fought and bled for and to elect function as a majority, stop the power sharing, 
stop the weakening of priority bills, stop the falling on our sword and yep. letting a couple not make it across the finish line or whatever, and, you know, actually function as a united majority. Yep. Um, I am down with that. I am yep. fully for that. I embrace that vision. I like to say, I hear you, I've heard you, or I've yep. heard you, I hear you, yep. and I'm going to give you what you want. Yep. And and I hope that my colleagues see that too, and they recognize yes. that, you know, for me, this is a recognition that the grassroots, yes, they have moved to the mm -hmm. right. Yes, the state has moved to the right. Yep. And we should be too. Yep. You've talked about Democrat chairs. You've talked about speeding up the process. You've talked about changing a relation, uh, the relationship status between the House and the Senate, the House and the Governor, the House and the Attorney General, the House and the Agriculture Commissioner, various different House and the Republican Party of Texas, the grassroots. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, we talked about this, but the at the Republican State Convention, you attended as a delegate. I did. You participated on the floor. I did. And, and that- I was recognized convention. on one of the mics. That's to talk right. About and a, you talked a about a, a, a vote that yes. took place and the, the floor listened to you and they said, we're going to vote this policy in place on the platform. And But at that convention, I mean, I think there were less than 20 Republican state reps that even showed up there to the convention. There were not many of us. Right? So this, this was a, a posturing towards- the largest political gathering outside of the Chinese Communist Party in the world is happening. And only 20 of the 85 Republican state reps are even showing up to engage in this process at mm -hmm. all. But you were there, you were a delegate, participating in the process. So we've talked about kind of changing the relationship status, Democrat chairs, speeding up the process. Um, parliamentarians, this comes up often. I don't think most people understand how a parliamentarian has become part of a major conversation about the direction of Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, that in itself is kind of ironic. Like, who is this parliamentarian guy? And why is he being talked about all the time regarding where the future of Texas is? But why do we have to talk about the parliamentarian? Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I think this gets to sort of a third big bucket that a lot of my colleagues, conservative colleagues are talking about. And that is that they're hopeful that the next speaker will actually give some power back to the members. The speaker has become incredibly powerful over the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Power has been concentrated in the speaker's office. The parliamentary process is certainly part of that. And mm -hmm. I think it really kind of hit me between the eyeballs squarely with SB 14 because I had to wait till the third try to even begin speaking about my bill. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even start my layout until the third time the bill came to the floor because there were changes to the parliamentary process that made the strike zone so inordinately large for the Democrats that were trying to strike me out yep. that essentially a ball's a strike, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so we saw last session, it got to the point where it was just so unmanageable that my colleagues, um, you know, Cody Vasut and Briscoe Cain, both of whom are very smart lawyers, literally had to spend almost their whole time on the floor defending other members' bills mm -hmm. because they were the only ones that could speak parliamentarian. I mean, I'm a doctor. I'm not a yep. lawyer. I yep. said in my speech, you know, I, I don't think you should have to be a lawyer to pass a bill in the yep. Texas House. We need subject matter experts to carry subjects that are complex and mm -hmm. that require somebody with knowledge and depth of knowledge to be able to defend against, you know, questions that they might get asked, bad amendments. I stood up there for what I think it was nine hours mm -hmm. and just calmly took one question after mm -hmm. another, after another. But I had to wait till the third time to even get started. Because, yeah. you know, the two points of order that were called on my bill the first one was because I used the word pediatrician, or no, I'm sorry, I used the word pediatric instead of pediatrician. And that was a valid point of order. Yep. And then the second time I removed the sentence that was causing concern, and the response I got was, well, now you don't actually have sufficient uh, documentation of proof that whatever you're asserting in this statement is actually backed up by yes. an objective source, right? Yes. So it's like, I felt like I was back in high school English class and people were asking, you know, where's my work cited page, yes. right? I mean, it was, it was like that. And, and so that's got to change. I remember a member who told me he was really cared a lot about this bill. So he actually was paying people to try to look at his bill 
to figure out all the potential points of order and then go into the parliamentarian and the parliamentarian saying, well, you're right. If this point of order gets called on this bill in this way, then I would sustain that. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. he goes, but if you changed it this way, it wouldn't. And then he came back to him and he said, well, if I change it the way you're telling me to change it to get rid of that point of order, I think they're going to call this point of order and say that I haven't done this. And he goes, yeah, they're probably going to do that too. And aren't they going to sustain it? Yeah. He goes, you can't tell me you're not allowed to pass this bill on the floor of the Texas House, right. which is essentially what sometimes the parliamentarian yeah. says. It's like, wait a second. You're telling me the three paragraphs on the bill caption or the description. You're saying these words are impossible to add into state code, even if this chamber wants to vote those words into state code right. because you've decided that there's no parliamentary way to add these three sentences into state yeah. code. It, it gets, it's a perversion of the process at some point. It is, and we're never going to win that fight. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, for Republicans, I mean, the, the bad news is yeah. on the parliamentary process side of things, <clears throat> there are way more lawyers around the building on the Democrat side who are willing, able, and competent to look for these points of orders than there are Republicans who are also knowledgeable and capable, who are willing to scrub for these points mm -hmm. of order and try to remove them. So yep. it, it is a process that has become, as I said in my speech, weaponized. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a process that disadvantages members. I think particularly on the conservative side, they're disadvantaged. Um, the Democrats, you know, I'll give them credit. They're very good at mm -hmm. the point of order game. Yep. I mean, they, they, it is a tool that they use frequently and often mm -hmm. and they're good at it. And, I just don't think that the process was ever designed to be that ticky-tack, right? And so I think the whole process needs to be reformed because at the end of the day, to me, this is one of the clearest examples of how power has been taken away from the membership yep. and concentrated in the speaker's office because mm -hmm. ultimately the speaker rules yes. on points of orders. The parliamentarians advise, yep. right? So, yes. so again, this is... Um, now, I'm not suggesting that the speaker should, you know, dis just take the rule book and throw it out the window and no. say, I don't care what the rules are. No. The speaker should follow the rules. Yes. But it is it is a uh, it is a piece of the puzzle by which power has been concentrated mm -hmm. in the office of the speaker. I would like to give that back to my members by constructively reforming that entire process mm -hmm. to make it to where any member who does you know, a reasonably good job of being informed about their bill, knows their bill, whatever, should reasonably expect that that bill's probably going to pass unless there's just some massive glaring mm -hmm. you know, point of order issue mm -hmm. thing, which sometimes there are. Yep. I'm not saying we should do away with yeah, points there, of there order. Yeah, there should never entirely. be points of order again. Right. You're I'm just saying right now, it's been weaponized. Yeah. And it's clear. If you've been on the House floor in the last two cycles, you've seen a massive uptick in the number of points of order and the success rate. America is at a crossroads. Now more than ever, Texas must step up and lead the country. We don't have time to mess around. The only way to save America is with a strong Texas. You and I know this, but so do the enemies of life and liberty. Therefore, you and I have no choice but to stand up and fight. I'm Sarah Gonzalez, and to the enemies of liberty, I say, come and take it. Tom, talk to me about any other ideas you have for the speaker to return power to the members from a structural perspective. Correct. Yeah, so I think the other really big way that a speaker could and should return power to the members is that I really, now that I've been in the House for four sessions, I've served under three speakers, mm -hmm. uh, I don't like the open-ended speakership where you get in power and you just your goal is to hang on to it for as long as you can before you get thrown off the carousel. Mm. Um, I think a speaker should voluntarily self-limit his speakership. Mm. Uh, if I was to serve as speaker, I would commit to serve to, for two terms and then I would want to retire. Mm. Um, because I do think what I've observed over time is that people get comfortable People like being in power. It becomes more of a game of holding on to what they got and keeping everyone else under their thumb so that no one rises up against them. And I think that's counterproductive for the body as a whole. It suppresses new ideas. It suppresses 
new leadership. You know, if you think about it, you end up having people that are sitting on the bench for session after session, not really able to live up to their full potential because essentially they're not part of, quote, the team, yeah. right? And so I think a healthy turnover, just like George Washington served two terms, yeah. I think a speaker should serve two terms and then voluntarily retire. It's interesting when you look back into how the house has operated for if if you take a hundred year horizon mm-hmm. and not a ten year horizon, you know most house members have only been there for ten years. You know this because mm-hmm. you serve with you came in and you're going. The vast majority of this chamber has come in with me or after me. That's right. The house has a lot of turnover by nature, but you have some members that have been there for a lot longer. Mm-hmm. And if you look at thirty or forty years, you realize. It is only in modern history, it's only in the last 10 years, that the assumption is that if you're the speaker, you're kind of there for a while. Yes, that's right. It used to be kind of commonplace that you would be speaker for a couple sessions, you'd serve the body, and then somebody else would be speaker for a couple sessions and serve the body. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people have talked about even the political aspect of the speakership has changed with that, in that that's why you have a speaker that gets... $100,000 $100,000 donations from one lobbyist. Or, or right. you know, meaning because once you have that position, it's like this guy's going to be the dictating policy for as long as he wants to dictate. And if he's a young guy and he's, you know, seems to have a pretty good grasp on relationships, he'll probably be there for a long time. We've it's it's just been a couple little things that have caused all of a sudden us to mm-hmm. maybe have a few speakers in a few years. Mm-hmm. But that being said, the mindset of people in Austin is if you're there. You're there for as long as you want to be there. Right. That's why you can raise $5 million in two months after getting elected speaker. So I think the political aspect, the term limit aspect, it, it changes the way people would treat that office. Oh, absolutely. It, I think it, it, and it forces, it forces both the membership, but also the speaker to be more accountable and more responsive, not just to the members, but also to the folks back home. Yeah. I think one of the things that's interesting to me is now I understand that obviously, you know, the lieutenant governor is a statewide elected official, but, you know, you, you mentioned a bunch of state officials. Yes. Um, yes, they're statewide elected officials, but they're so much more involved in what's going on at the local level and across Texas. And, you know, they're at this event and they're speaking for this group and they're helping here. Yeah. And the speaker, it, from what I have seen over three speakers, yeah. is okay, probably goes to a trade group here and there and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Maybe goes to a fundraiser for a member because the member asked him to come. Mm -hmm. But the speaker's not really doing a lot of that good work for the grassroots, for the party, for the people. And I really think that office, I think the office of speaker, it is a big platform. Mm -hmm. It's a big megaphone. Mm -hmm. And I think the speaker could also play a better role in terms of working with the grassroots and working with the party and working with the electorate uh, around the state. Because if you think about it, you you still, as a speaker, represent the entire state of Texas vis-a-vis you preside over a chamber where there are 149 other districts, 150, including your own. And so I think that actually would also be a positive thing if the speaker would actually go to the state convention and be part of that process. And uh, and go around, you know, when it's election time and, and essentially help the land commissioner and help the agricultural commissioner and the attorney general and the governor and lieutenant governor to raise money and to, you know, help candidates and to do all of these things. Um, we've seen a little bit of that, yep. in, but I feel like that office could do more. And I also think if they did that, they would be far less insulated from what it is that the grassroots are actually mm-hmm. saying that they really want. I feel like there's a disconnect right now that exists. Yep. The You have been critical of the impeachment process. Mm-hmm. Are there changes that you would make to that impeachment process as speaker? There's, there, you know, Some people have talked about even passing bills that actually change the way the impeachment process works. But ultimately, whoever is the speaker, even without a bill, could dictate how an impeachment process would work. If if it were to happen in the house, so what what's your what's your thoughts? Yeah, on that? I think that. The, and then a last question. I'm going to add one to sure, to sure. second follow up is, how do you think the house should consider impeaching 
a member of its own party? What, how should that even be considered within the process of what the House is trying to do, handing these type of wins to Democrats? I'd like your thoughts on yeah. that too. Yeah, so I think, first of all, including myself, I think the vast majority of people that voted against impeachment felt as though it was a process that they just couldn't support, mm -hmm. right? And and I know there were members like um, my desk mate, uh, Mike Schofield, mm -hmm. uh, John Smithy, who said, look, you know, this is not due process. Yep. This is not a respect. This is not a process that's, you're, you're, you know, you're bringing this person up on charges. You're accusing them of all this stuff. You literally just drop this in our lap and you're asking us to make a decision. We can't yep. talk to any of the witnesses. We can't even doc. There's a whole list and I'm not a lawyer. Yes. So I don't know all the, yep. you know, lawyerly things that yep. need to be fixed. But I do think in principle, one of the first things that we should do next session is we ought to take a look at how that process played out, what could have and should have been done or better, especially in view of the fact this wasn't the first time mm -hmm. that an impeachment process occurred, but mm -hmm. it was certainly handled differently yes. than it had been in the past. Yep. And perhaps we need to clarify that statute. I would be in support of clarifying that whole process to make sure that sort of this rush to judgment thing that yep. we engaged in with Ken Paxton doesn't happen to somebody else. The way I would use a medical term is it's like somebody comes in and they're like, my stomach hurts. And they're like, look, I think we need to cut you wide open right. tomorrow. And they're like, what? Should you do like an MRI? They're like, Tch. No Let's just need. cut to the chase. I, I, I got a feeling I know this. Yeah. And they're like, okay, well, when we get to the Senate, they're going to do an MRI and an X-ray and a... And then they do, and they're like, well, this looks a lot different than when you just cut this body open because they had a stomach ache. And so you're seeing that even play out with the recent essentially dropping of the charges against Ken Paxton on the security yeah. front. I mean, again, you can call somebody, oh, this guy's going to go to prison for 100 years, which is what everybody heard. And then they hear, oh, actually, he's going to do some community service and some other things. Um, Democrats would love for a Republican House that is intent on attacking other Republican statewide officials as opposed to them. Right? Oh, for sure. They, they benefit. They love that. They all voted for impeachment, as yeah. I recall. That's right. And 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 uh, I think even in the delay tactics that you've talked about, they benefit from basically having all these serious policy discussions in May. Mm -hmm. That, in a sense, the structure incentivizes them to participate in this theater because they're being handed these things on a silver platter. So just overall, as you go from chair of insurance to now speaker candidate, how, and we've talked, because Democrat chairs, all these are specifics. I just want to close with mm -hmm. this. How do you feel like that relationship status changes with Democrats as we go into this new paradigm? So I think, you know, again, I, I have a reputation in my four sessions. You know, we talked a little bit about you know, how different members conduct themselves mm -hmm. and take sort of different pathways. My pathway has always been a pathway of, I'm happy to work with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I have a great track record of bipartisanship, and that's not going to change. I'm mm -hmm. going to continue to work with my colleagues uh, across the aisle on the things that are like 90% of the stuff that we mm -hmm. do that everybody agrees is good stuff. But I'm not going to wait until the end to do the 10% of stuff that mm -hmm. we feel like we need to get done. It's, I will say this, it, it's never made a lot of sense to me that that one of the things in, as, as a, you know, if you're a speaker candidate and you're trying to get to be speaker, and so part of your coalition is Democrats, you owe them things, right? Yep. Because they, they, they're part of your 76. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that, first of all. I want 76 Republicans, and then we'll talk, right? Yep. But 76 Republicans first. But we have historically given them things to sort of, quote, keep the temperature down or do, you know, whatever, make them happy. That means falling on our sword on mm -hmm. something that they don't want us to pass. Um, the D-Trans Bill of Rights might have mm -hmm. been one of those this yep. session. I think you could make an you could make a case that that was actually the blocker bill on the mm -hmm. last calendar. Mm -hmm. um, that's the bill that the Democrats are sort of chubbing so that they mm -hmm. never get to it, uh, and they succeeded. They had a big celebration that they didn't mm -hmm. have to take up that bill, and a lot of my friends, detransitioners that were helping me, were were crying. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and 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 because some people don't understand how that process works, when the calendars committee sets a calendar, they decide whether a bill is on page seven or page three, and then where they put it 
kind of determines whether or not Democrats have the ability to chub to it. The perception from outside the building is often that some deal is cut before that calendar is set. That, and uh, I hear members say things like, the Democrats seem to know what page we're going to get to on the last yeah. day of session, right? Yeah. Like they, they, you're walking around like, how far are we getting? They're like, oh, we're getting, we're getting to page three. Oh, yeah. okay, my bill's on page. Well, how, how do y'all know what page we're getting to? Does right. That, so I, I do feel that way. And I want to be clear that I've served on calendars before. So I've kind of seen it on the inside. Yeah. I really, I don't lay that at the feet of the calendars committee or the calendars chair as much as I lay that at the feet of the back office. Because you got to remember that calendars and local calendars are unique and that it's the only two committees where the speaker appoints all everyone. the members. Everyone. They yeah. control everyone. So everyone that's on that committee is somebody who's friendly to the back hallway. So if the speaker's office calls and says, you know, we need to a certain placement on a certain, I mean, you know that's going to happen, yes. right? I mean, and so I think people don't understand the calendars committee in general. Individual calendars committee members are not literally sitting down putting one bill on that's page right. three versus one that's bill right. on page four. But people people like to say, well, that's the calendars chair's fault. I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that the decision to put this bill in this spot yes. is necessarily, especially if it's a if it's yes. a high five to Democrats. As I said the other day. I'm not sure that that's really the calendar's chair doing that. In fact, I'm confident that that's probably not who made the deal. That's definitely a deal in my opinion, yeah. but that's not the calendar's chair making that deal. But the point is, and this is what I don't understand is, so we do things like that. First of all, they can't even go home and explain to their electorate that they got a win out of that because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like, why would the Republicans do that, right? <laughs> like, you're telling me that, so, okay, all of these other bills that we hate pass, but this one over here, you were able to prevent them from getting that one done and that's supposed to be a win. Yeah. But secondly, like it doesn't even work. Mm -hmm. You remember in 2021, there were priorities that didn't make it across the finish line. Yep. I think one could make a reasonable look at some of the, you know, placement and calendars and make some assumptions about some of the bills and what happened to them and stuff like that. But then they broke quorum anyway mm -hmm. and went to D.C. because they decided they didn't want to pass a voter integrity bill. So it's yeah. not, the thing is like, it doesn't really even work. Yeah, the Democrats have not said, okay, thank you for the Democrat chairs we have. Thank you for letting us chub this bill. Therefore, we'll start to behave. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I suppose you could say, and I will say this, I do think that there's been a strong emphasis over the last three sessions on daily clock management. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times there are things that are sort of deals that are made ahead of time in order to reduce the amount of fighting on the floor, mm -hmm. reduce the amount of time that we're actually debating this or debating that. And so a lot of this is pre-negotiated, pre-settled. Yep. And so at some point, it's almost kind of like a little bit of sort of, you know, kabuki theater, right? Yes. A little bit kind of like- yep. Like you're going to get your three amendments. Yep. You're going to get two points of or three points of order, and and then you're going to get to give five speeches where you call us racist, and then we're going to pass the bill. <laughs> so right, and so it's yes. like, and, and look, I, I I get that that's part of the no, process. I mean, by the way, that is the way a lot of members feel. I mean, when I talk to them, and then other people who sit in the gallery and watch this happen, they feel like, is this whole thing just all? Everyone knows what's going. Then you're going to cry, and again, you go, they're all. We all just got called racist for a whole day. Right. And then the next day, we're supposed to act like, isn't the Texas House one of the best chambers in the, in yeah. the world? And I don't think that's necessarily, quote, ideologically wrong. It's just a completely <laughs> different management style, right? That do, I'm not afraid to have a fight on the House floor. Yeah, and I think that's something you've said. You said, look, we can have a fight on Monday and still work together on Tuesday. That's right. You want a chamber that does that. You I do. want a chamber that says, I do. we had it out. And now we happen to be working together because the bills on today's calendar are a little less controversial. And then tomorrow, by the way, we're probably going to have it out again. You mentioned, and I think this is actually a great thing that we need to cover before we close, is the speaker being selected in caucus. The last two speakers have had a press conference that they scheduled before the caucus met. And they said, they both started their press conference with, the race for speaker is over. Mm -hmm. Here are... Here's a majority of the chamber that selected me as speaker, and it includes Republicans and Democrats. That's right. Which means that before the, 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 both Dade Field and Dennis Bonin 
and I'm not asking you to comment on either of those two individuals, but both of those individuals were courting Republicans and Democrats at the same time they were running for speaker to get a majority of the House together. And so you laid out in your announcement a path to getting elected in the caucus by a majority That's of the right. caucus that it would be different than the way the last two speakers have been elected. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that the grassroots and the Republican Party everybody have been asking for for a long time. It kind of started under Strauss. The, the, the framework was built under Strauss, but the rules weren't quite followed. That, and yes. so I, I think it's important for you to lay out not only the way you're conducting your race, but how you feel like this race should be conducted as a whole. Because there will be other entrants into this race. Sure. I think everybody knows that. What are the rules that we should all generally agree on that are going to mean that we're less likely to have this continued civil war in 2025? Yeah, so I think the first thing is, you know, for the folks back home to understand that the status quo, the play, is a pressure cooker type play. It, it's essentially, you pick up the pieces, whoever's left over after the primaries are all said and done, you go around and you find the, the, this lone member who's sitting on a bench all by themselves over here. You try to gather up as many of those people as you can. Whoever you can get then, you sort of fill in the ranks with people from the other side who obviously don't want to lose their chairmanships because mm -hmm. they like the status quo. And then you're like, hey, we've got the votes. We're, we, we can... Uh, you know, we can say that the race is over um, or we have gotten enough Republicans to buy into the status quo through pressure and, you know, pushing on them mm -hmm. that at this point in July, we can confidently say that we have enough members that we can prevent anyone else from winning in the caucus. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying to the folks back home very clearly is if you want this process to play out in a way that you have 76 Republicans going on the House floor, rallied behind one speaker candidate yes. without Democrat interference in that process, you have to tell them to hold fast. Yep. You can't let them get picked off by this group or that group. Um, now, if somebody puts together 76 Republicans yes. from the caucus, ahead of the caucus, we're still going to do the caucus just yes. to prove that it's real. Yes. But hey, if you want to show us your cards and yes. you've got, you know, 76 Republican names on yep. a list of people that are backing you, I salute you. Yes. Right? I certainly hope that that is someone who will embrace the platform that I have laid out. Yep. The reason people say, well, why did you do this so early? The reason, the main reason I did it early is because I felt like I knew this was what the people back home wanted. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to set the bar by coming out early and saying, this is what the people want. They want a majority party ruling as a majority party. They want the Democrat chair thing to go away. Mm -hmm. And they want us to stop sitting on our hands early in session and get to work. Yep. And if someone were able to come along behind me and announce and put together 76 votes and they yep. were in support of that platform, I would roll up my sleeves and work hard to get them elected. And what you have said is, if somebody else shows up that can bring 76 people together, then I'm ready to go to the floor with them. Yeah, absolutely. And if somebody shows up and says, I went and met with the Democrats and I've got Democrats on board, the Republican caucus is going to have a really tough decision to make. They are. They are. And yeah. because remember that that caucus <clears throat> meeting, which would happen probably the first weekend in December. Yes. <clears throat> those those are, that's sort of a closed door meeting. You can think of it like the nomination of the Pope, right? Yes. We're, we're in there until the white smoke comes out. Yes. That's how it's supposed to go. We have multiple rounds until we mm -hmm. get to somebody that at minimum achieves three-fifths majority of the caucus yes. voting by secret ballot for them. Yep. Uh, at that point, every Republican caucus member is honor-bound, and the platform also says they are honor-bound to go to the floor and vote for that member. Yep. So, um, so it, if you don't bypass it with Democrats, this really has been structurally designed to say— Everyone's going to go in. And yeah, yes. the the 10 most liberal Republicans are probably not going to be able to prevent somebody from getting the nomination. Mm -hmm. You have to have somebody that brings a decent amount of this caucus together under somebody. And the belief would be that with how tired the caucus is in general with the current civil war that we are in, 
They're looking for somebody that has laid out a lot of these ideas to say, we have a path to something different. Mm -hmm. And so the if you want the status quo to remain, one of your only options is to kind of go, no, we really do need to go try to get some of these Democrats on board beforehand. But what mm -hmm. you've said is, we have to start saying right now, that's off the table. That's right. We're not going to the Democrats. We are going to go into this caucus meeting. If you want to go get a bunch of people on your team before the caucus meets, that's everyone's right. But right. make them Republicans that you're getting on your team. And make sure that that candidate, I mean, I would simply say, I don't, I don't know that it's going to be, I don't think that it's going to be good for mm -hmm. a member long-term in terms of their district if they're given a credible option supporting candidates, you know, who are saying no Democrat chairs. Yes. And then they jump on board before the caucus meeting yep. with somebody who has clearly articulated, no, we're not changing anything. We're not doing anything yes. differently. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be a member grassroots conversation. Yes. But I mean, to my way of thinking, again, I've heard you, I hear you. I'm yes. giving you what you've asked for. I believe very strongly that that's what the people want. Yep. And and I'm prepared to give that to them. And I'm not going to back down from that. But everybody out there should know that these members are going to get tugged on from all sides. Yes. And so, you know, hopefully they stay engaged as mm -hmm. grassroots and encourage their members, tell them to pray about it, remind them that, look, this is a chance for a new day. Mm -hmm. This is a chance for a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Please buy into the new vision. Please support the change. This yep. is what we have fought for to keep you in power, to get you elected for the first time, to keep you there, whatever. Support that, please. Yep. Representative, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Well, I hope y'all learned a lot from that conversation. I hope you see that there are a lot of very productive conversations going on inside the Texas House, inside the Republican caucus, and in the broader conversation with the grassroots, with elected officials, um, with activists, with candidates who have stepped up all across the state. These conversations, I do believe, are leading us to a place where Republicans will be more united about shared conservative ideas, policies, principles, and agen an agenda that people can get behind, and less at each other's throats. Now, ultimately, these are going to be decisions made by individual members in the Republican caucus that to decide what they want to do. But each and every one of you will have a role to play. You all have a state representative. You all have people you know, and you're organized throughout the state of Texas. So I think Representative Oliverson's message to you at the end was important for you to take action on in some form or fashion and reach out to the people you know, have the conversations, not only with your elected official, but with all the activists that you know throughout the state of Texas. It might be that your representative is a Democrat. My state representative is a Democrat. I'm going to be honest. I don't think he really cares about whether the speaker is elected in the caucus of the Republican Party, but I have a ton of friends who live in Bear County who have other Republican state representatives. So engaging them in this conversation then has that passed up to people who are going to make decisions on this process. So just keep that in mind, guys. We really appreciate coming to you every single week. May God bless you, and may God bless the great state of Texas. Do you want to get your news from people who share your values? Texas Scorecard. Real news for real Texans.